So, so Gabdiel, I think we're a little bit past the hour. If you would do the honor of introducing Fernando, we would go ahead and get started. Thank you very much. Thank you. I delegated that task to Miss Erica. So ah, participation okay. is better. So, okay. Erica, there you go. Thank you. Um, all right, I'll do the introduction. Um, Dr. Garcia is an agronomist with an MS in plant biotechnology and a PhD in plant science in the area of plant health and plant breeding from Wageningen University. His scientific career started in 2005, working in Sena Cafe, the National Coffee Research Center in Colombia, where he worked in the area of coffee breeding for seven years. He was a lecturer during the time in a local university. Then he came to the Netherlands for his PhD, focusing his studies on banana and fusarium wilts, AKA Panama disease, working in the laboratory of plant breeding and phytopathology. Since 2018, he has been a postdoctoral researcher at Key Gene in the Netherlands, working as a breeder in the recently established banana breeding program, recently promoted to principal researcher and is now leading the breeding pant breeding banana program at Kijin. Additionally, he is a consultant on diagnostics of Panama disease, tropical race four, and usually giving workshops in Latin America about this important topic. <clears throat> Last year, he wrote a book about the, the guides for diagnostic in Spanish. Uh, he is in charge of coordinating the first reports of the disease caused by Fusarium tropical race four in several countries, including Jordan, Pakistan, Lebanon, and the Great Mekong area in 2019 in Colombia, the first insurrection of the disease in Latin America. I'll hand it off to you, Dr. Garcia. Are you trying to talk, Dr. Garcia? Dr. Garcia, uh, if you can hear me, I think you can go ahead uh, with your presentation whenever you're ready. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Okay, yeah, I had to remove my headphones because it was not working. So yeah, thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Uh, I'm very passionate about this topic, so I can talk really uh, hours about this, but uh, I'm going to focus especially in the topics that I'm working with, like a breathing and a little bit about diagnostics. So thanks again, uh, Dr. Bennett and, and Gabdiel for the kind invitation. It's really an honor for me to, to share a little bit of my work here. So I will ask you to think about bananas in this moment for one second. And I guess the first thing that comes to your mind is this image, right? The typical yellow banana, the beautiful and perfect banana that you can find in essentially every supermarket around the world and which is used to different uh, type of sweet desserts. That's why this banana is known globally as a dessert banana. This banana belongs to a subgroup known as Cavendish. So the first thing that I, I would like to make clear here is that Cavendish is not a cultivar or a variety. Cavendish is a group of cultivars, which include the most popular, which are uh, essentially clones. We have the grand name, Group Williams, Pollo, Valerie, and a lot of more. So it doesn't matter the sticker you find in every banana in the supermarkets is essentially the same. But bananas are more than that, especially for countries in Latin America, in Africa, for example, bananas are more than the dessert type of banana. We also have the cooking type of banana that believe it or not is even more important because it's a staple food 
in many regions. So all you can, things that you can you can observe in this picture are typical dishes for every day in, in, in Latin America and also in Africa. Every part of the fruit of the plant is used in different ways. Some people use it as um, the fibers, the fruit, and in this case, for example, even to make a beer. So banana diversity is just huge, is uh, bigger than you think. There are more than a thousand varieties which include different types of, of bananas, including, for example, triploids, diploids, and, and a known number of hybrids. With hybrids, I'm talking about the, um, the products of breeding programs, and of course, the wild types. So the picture you are going to see now is just a little bit of the diversity of the banana that you can observe and you can find in the centers of origin, like for example, in, in, in Southeast Asia. So the ones that you observe here, let me change this uh, cursor. These ones are the diploids. These are known as traditional land races in many areas around the world. Uh, as you can see, in terms of productivity, they are not the best. They are actually very ugly let's say like that, but also they are actually very interesting because as you can see, there are different colors, shapes, aromas, taste, which is very important for the diversity. The important thing of these uh, materials is that they are compatible to each other most of the time, not always, but it's easier to cross them. While in this case, the triploids, which you observe here are highly productive, beautiful, homogeneous. These are the type of bananas that people are used to find in the supermarkets. Of course, we are only used to this kind of, of bananas, the cavities, but there are many others that are consumed in different regions. They are triploid, which means that are sterile. They are not easy to breed, to improve. And finally, we have the group of wild relatives. This is just an example of the diversity of wild relatives that exist in the center of origin in Southeast Asia. Again, as you can see here, there are many possibilities in terms of inter interesting traits, like highly productive shapes, different aromas, tastes, etc. The problem with these materials is that they are full of seeds, as you can see in this picture. So we cannot just eat them, but they are important because several of these uh, materials are resistant to plant diseases. If we talk about a little bit about bananas, bananas belong to the Musacea family in the genus Musa. And they are divided into different sections based on the number of chromosomes. Some researchers like to use the four sections that had been used traditionally for many, many years, but some other modern taxonomists have joined and combined these sections. For example, these two and these two are considered just one now. Diversity again in these groups is high, but the most important part of this slide is that you should remember that I would say 99% of the edible bananas come from the interaction between these two species, Musa cuminata and Musa valvisiana. All these are the, the, the ones that originated bananas that we have now. As you can see here, uh, these are the ancestors of the banana. Musa cuminata usually refer as the donor of the genome A and Musa valvisiana donor of the, of the genome B. The combination inter and intraspecific between some species and even uh, sub and uh, species and subspecies, uh, uh, many hybridizations provide what we have at the moment. So we have, for example, diploids with different combinations of A genomes. We have, uh, the, the, of course, the Cavendish, and we have uh, all these combinations of uh, genomes, AB, ABB, which gave all the diversity of bananas that we have. So the domestication of the banana started 7,000 years ago. As I mentioned before, a lot of different um, interspecific and intraspecific uh, combination between species and subspecies combined with the um, abortion of seeds to, uh, to reach this point of the Parthenocarpi, which along with uh, selection by humans uh, provide what we have now, that is uh, fruits without seeds and fruits as, uh, and plants that we can propagate vegetatively without needing without the need of seeds. And among this group, we have, of course, the Cavendish type of banana, the most famous type of banana, which is without doubts, the, the king of the fruits. 
In this slide, I just want to point out about the business of the banana. So from the whole production of bananas for the export, only 20%, around 20% is dedicated to the export markets. The rest of the, of the production is, is dedicated to the internal consumption. So for example, we have India, Africa, Brazil, uh, among the biggest banana producer, but they don't don't produce bananas for the export market, they produce bananas for themselves. Well, if we talk about the export market, we have, for example, um, you, it, this change every year, but we have, for example, uh, these uh, five countries that account for more than 70% uh, of the production of banana for the export. In this group, we have uh, all from Latin America and we have Philippines. From, the, from this production, 50% is produced by big multinationals and the other 50% for the small growers. Important in this slide to remember that from this group, Philippines and for many years and Colombia since 2019 are dealing with the problem that we are talking today. So with a little bit of story before the Cavendish, we have another cultivar, another group cultivar, which was the Gros Michel. The Grand Michel was uh, a different cultivar, which was preferred because of the uh, high productivity, as you can see here, and especially because it was OED is a rustic material that it has a, a peel which is very strong and resist uh, is is bruising resistant, and also it is important because of the ability that it had to to resist long trips. So this is actually the way how the bananas were transported many years ago. So the, 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 the bunches were just cut from the trees and then put them on the chips and send them to, to other countries. So the story of the Gros Michel at this in the reports starts in 1830 in a, in a botanical, in a garden in Martinique. And from there, just distributed to the Caribbean and then to the world. But in, in 1890, the first signs of the disease started to appear because there, there, was, there were signs of plants getting sick for unstrained disease. So the first losses due to the, the strange disease were reported in Costa Rica and Panama, and that's why it's called the Panama disease, because of the big impact in, in Central America, especially in Panama. The, the responsible for that disease was later known as the race one of Fusarinoxis from Forma Specialis, which because the, the big epidemic, the historical epidemic of the previous century. So in this century, many, many things happened, but also for the banana. So the history of the banana was divided in two because uh, at the end of the fifties, because of the disease and gradually, it was more and more difficult to produce gross Michel bananas. The disease was so spread and it was so dramatic that finding bananas was actually difficult in, in some countries. This situation even inspired a uh, very famous song like this one. Yes, we have no bananas. And then the end of the Gros Michel era arrived around the half of the previous century. Of course, pathologists, breeders, and many researchers tried to, to save the banana at that time by using different methodologies or techniques. In this case, I'm just showing one of them that was the flooding for, con for disease control. So this actually worked uh, for some time and they were able to use the same soils again for Gros Michel for some time. But this methodology also contributed to the dissemination of the, of the disease to other regions. And then this really became a, a dream. And that was actually the end of the era Gros Michel. And then, and then uh, here I also want to make it clear that it was not like finish of Gros Michel and then immediately Cavendish. Actually the Cavendish was establishing from many years before the 50s. So, but it was gradually, but at the end of the 50s was difficult to continue with Rose Michel and everyone adopted the Cavendish types. So what was the thing with the Cavendish? That the Cavendish was resistant to the race one of this pathogen. But of course, people had to adapt to a new cultivar that was a little bit more quick, let's say. In this moment, this time we had to pack the banana juice called for transportation and a lot of this foam to try to keep it pretty for the supermarkets. That's the main difference with Gros Michel. By the way, the Gros Michel didn't go stink as people say, because 
that's we can say that was extinct for the market, but not for the in real life because we have a, a big production of growth Michelin in many in many countries in Latin America, in Costa Rica, in Colombia, still production, but not for the export because of the race one. So Cavendish is really an, an interesting um, genotype. It's, it's really um, because, uh, amazing because I think there is not another example similar to this type of resistance. For more than 100 years, the Cavendish is still resistant to, to, gross Miche to, sorry, to Panama disease race one. And actually the same soils that were used to grow Gros Michel are, are being used now to grow uh, Cavendish. And again, we fool the, the, the soils with the new cultivar in monocultures. And let's say that the Cavendish saved the industry, but not forever, because at, at the beginning of the nineties, um, big plantations were affected by something similar. And that was, the arrival of the, the what is known as the Panama disease version two, the, that, that is actually caused for, by a different race of the pathogen, a, a race that was um, that is known as Fusarium tropical race four. So at the beginning, it was a problem from the Southeast Asia, even though the big, the, the big problems started in the 90s, the tropical race four exists since many, many years ago, but it was really a, a big um, in the news or having a big impact when it started to reach big plantations of Cavendish in Taiwan and in other countries, like for example, in the north, in, in the north of Australia. So at the beginning, it was a local problem that suddenly started to become, to become a, a pandemic. For many years, it was reported only in five countries in this area until 2012. And from, from 2012 until now, there are more than 20 countries with the, with the disease. So in 2012, we found it for the first time in Jordan, then in, it was identified in Oman, and, and then in different countries in this area, even in the United Kingdom. And last year, and sorry, in, in 2019, unfortunately in Colombia, and last year also in Turkey and in Islas Mayotte, in Mayotte Island, sorry. Here I want to do another break, another parenthesis to, to tell you a little bit about my work in diagnostics. So when I worked at the university as PhD, I had the opportunity to, to uh, work with diagnostics so because of the experience I had with molecular uh, tools. Uh, I had to check uh, different samples that we got from different, from different uh, lineage. So everything you observe here is race one. The first one, Odoratissimum, is the new tropical race four. And she also found another two uh, different species, let's call it like that, that uh, can actually cause disease on, on, gross uh, on Cavendish that are not in the known diversity of Fusarium. So these are actually new threats for the global banana collection uh, production. Let's talk a little bit about the impact, which is very difficult to measure because in this disease, being a quarantine organism, the only way to, to control is by destroying the complete uh, almost the complete farm. And that means that for some producers, uh, the area that they have to destroy is actually their complete uh, uh, farm. In other cases, is of course part of the farm. So it's a very difficult pathogen and the impact is, is very complicated, too complicated to measure. So this is uh, two different scenarios, as you can see, uh, Jordan and Pakistan, which the production is not as big as in the countries that export banana. But of course, in this case, the impact is, is, is huge. In the case of Colombia, uh, it was reported in 2019. Again, if you find one plant, of course, you have to eradicate the complete area of, uh, of risk. And that uh, the spread, of course, is uh, start to appear in different areas because unfortunately, we found it in, in I think it was July, uh, July of uh, 2019. But that doesn't mean that the pathogen was there in July. We assume that it was there at least, like being optimistic, one year earlier. So just imagine the amount of uh, area that had to be destroyed. When I traveled to Colombia to help with the diagnostics of this, there were only two farms uh, with the presence of the pathogen. After a few uh, months, it, it was essentially nine, uh, seven, and then nine farms 
and that represents in the north of Colombia 60% of the of the area that has to be in quarantine. So one month later, in we have to inform the complete country that we have that uh, pathogen in Colombia, which is the first report in, in Latin America. Yeah, and it's very important because it puts in alarm for the whole region, the whole region of banana producer co producing countries. So we are still doing some work um, with uh, phylogenetic studies with the um, with the isolates we have and the strains from uh, from different areas. For now, in preliminary um, results, we have that Colombia is not really completely related to the other uh, isolates. So we still need to to do more analysis, but we can uh, claim that it's still in the in the second clade, together with the ones from Lebanon, Jordan, and um, and Indonesia. But we still need to do more about that. Uh, and that will come in another part of the world that we are doing, in which we are actually um, evaluating the whole, a, a big population, a big um, survey of Fusarion in different parts of the world. So together with the, with the other uh, collaborators at the University of uh, Utrecht, for example, and Wageningen, building this uh, phylogenetic study that allows to understand a little bit more the, this complex situation with the taxonomy of the Fusarium. The most important of this slide is that in this case, it, uh, the, the things that are blue here are associated to race one. As, as you can see, there are very many different uh, clades, but in the case of the tropical race four, it's just, just big, a big one. So what have we learned from the past? Actually, not much. The history repeats itself. There is not awareness. The soils are contaminated. People are just moving to other areas. People are even changing crops in Southeast Asia, just growing rice instead of bananas. Uh, of course, losing a lot of income. There, there is not a replacement for the Cavendish this time, as we had in the past, the Cavendish to replace Rose Michel. So far, there is not a, a variety that is resistant to tropical risk for. Uh, and the control is, is difficult just to establish in the field. So there are a few strategies to, I don't like to say control because it's not possible, but to manage the disease. So these are essentially five strategies, uh, two scenarios, one for countries without the disease. So that's just quarantine and exclusion. And for countries with the problem, there are some few solutions focused on biological control, chemical control, cultural control, and genetic control. And I'm focusing mostly in the genetic control that means uh, breeding. So there are essentially three options for breeding. We have uh, pre-existing genotypes. That means that we would like to find something like Cavendish for, but resistant to tropical race four and something that already exists because something also very important for you to know is that the Cavendish is not a product of breeding. It's just a mutant that was there and luckily was resistant to race one. We have conventional breeding. So using uh, crosses, and non-conventional breeding, which includes uh, gene editing, uh, uh, GMOs, and uh, mutants. So what I'm going to show here is part of my work as PhD, and then my postdoc, and now as, as a researcher. So this was at Bakken University. The first thing we need for breeding, of course, is source of resistance. And that's what I did part of, of my work at the university during my PhD was to identify resistance. So we collected different genotypes from different collections around the world. And from the collection of 1,100 potential genotypes, we make a filter of 350. And then based on morphological, especially morphological uh, characteristics, we filter even more and we managed to screen 245 different uh, accessions. So when I came to the university, I was the first one working with tropical race four in this type of studies. And the protocols were very, were difficult because we could inoculate only 50 plants at the time. So I have to improve those protocols. I, I spent some time trying to standardize and to fix and to improve protocols for a spore production for um, inoculation itself. And we passed from 60 to 12,000 plants simultaneously using different strains. So I have also some videos on YouTube that you can see how this is done. I um, decided to go for conventional breeding um, because of the acceptance of the product. 
at the end. So let's say when there are more, when people are more open to GMOs, probably I will also try to work in that area. But for now I've been working on um, conventional breeding. Sorry for this Spanish word here, but essentially what I want to show in this slide is that for, tr for traditional breeding, there are two strategies or two schools, let's say, but both uh, looking for the same access to divert to genetic variation or even create variation and then select uh, the ones that look with the traits that you want and create new genotypes. There are two schools of in, in breeding of banana. I don't know in other crops, seems to be the same, but for banana, there are two ways to do it. One is called evolutionary of by pedigree, which is just traditionally do, done in this way. They usually use a triploid with different genetic combination and then cross it, they cross it with a diploid in, in with the idea to obtain secondary triploids. And the triploids are the ones that become a variety after the process of breeding. And the other way is the reconstructive breeding, which actually try to find the closest ancestors of, of the one that you want to improve. For example, if you want the Cavendish, then you go to look for the more similar to Cavendish, but you go back to the diploids. And in the at diploid level, you improve because the, the diploids are, are fertile and are compatible to each other. So you can essentially combine them. And then also obtain triplets. How do, how do we do it? There are many ways, but one of the most common techniques is to double the chromosomes. And then we come back to this way in which we can combine a, a diploid for a triploid and then obtain secondary triploids. So since 2018, I'm working at Kijin, uh, first as a postdoc and then, and, and actually like three weeks ago, I started as a researcher. So I'm in charge of the breeding now program at, at Kijin. Uh, these are my colleagues and we are focusing on traditional breeding, but we are using high tech to trying to accelerate all these procedures. So we are using the information that I generate during my uh, PhD by selecting materials that are resistant. Uh, so I, in this slide, what you observe is the different groups of or types of bananas, the hybrids, which are product of breeding, wild types, but also the diploids, uh, uh, sorry, the cultivars, which can be diploids or triploids. What you see in yellow, uh, sorry, in green and orange are the, the, the the section that are resistant, which is very low actually. So 80% of the material that I tested from those 250 materials, only 13% was resistant to tropical race four. Resistant in the level of race one to Cavendish. So this level, this is a plant that, that was cut in the middle and is, as you can see, clean. So this, the results of my work had been used by Sirat, for example, in France to generate um, material that are similar to Cavendish and we are using that kind of strategy. So I'm using uh, these materials to make crosses. I'm doing that under greenhouse conditions since 2018. And apart from that, of course, we are, as I mentioned before, we are making use of the technology. So what we did was to sequence uh, a lot of different uh, diploids that we could use as parentals for, for the crosses. The ones with the with the star here are material that have been tested for tropical race four and that are resistant. The interesting part of this is that, for example, for your knowledge, Cavendish and, and Rose Michel are actually siblings. They share uh, one of the parentals, and the other genome comes from a different way. So the idea for the reconstructive breeding is to identify materials from this group, which is actually, as you can see, resistant, but not using the same as that the Cavendish has, but similar to them and try to recreate a Cavendish type of banana. Of course, Cavendish is the, is the, um, the objective now because we need a replacement. But for us, the idea is to increase the diversity of banana in the market. So we would like to have this type of bananas, for example, red bananas or, or bananas with different uh, characteristics, etc. At Kijin, we are also doing analysis like, for example, Yiwas, because we have sequence uh, these materials, but also phenotype them by different traits. We have something that's called Musapiria, which is actually internally a kind of um, database with a lot of genomic information in which we can actually compare uh, genomes. Because we, we also um, 
sequence the Cavendish and indeed find interesting genes, candidate genes. So one of the tasks that I've been working in the last month is to, it's also a BSI for, for TR4. So we have the genotyping, but we also have the phenotyping. I generated populations at, under greenhouse conditions. As you can see here, these are seeds that unfortunately are very difficult to germinate. The rate of germination of seeds is 20% more or less. So we have to do embryo rescue for these seeds. And then of course we seek, we phenotype those plants. As you can see here, there is segregation and we are actually very close to find a region of interest link to that trait of resistance. So we hope to find a, a gene that we can use. Additionally, we, we have joined together with the University of Wageningen to the breeding program in, in Africa, just to also to help, but of course to learn from them because they, they know a lot about breeding. They are focusing on bananas in Africa. Apart from traditional breeding, there are many researchers working in, in different strategies to breed bananas in a different way, in the non-conventional way. So you might be uh, familiar with Dr. James Dell from Australia who actually developed transgenic bananas with resistance to tropical race four. And that's actually the only gene, the only known gene so far in, in the banana. So just imagine this super important crop, but we know so little about it. There is only one gene associated with resistance in, in so far. And Dr. James Dell had incorporated into a, a Cavendish making it resistant. So this is one. Um, the, the plants are really resistant. We test them here at the, univer at the university. Uh, there is other people, other researchers, like for example, the, uh, Dr. Tripathi, which is working with the CRISPR-Cas, which so far with very good results in terms of the technology. But of course, for these, you need genes. And as I mentioned before, we have only one gene at the moment. Another strategy is a mutation breeding, which is done in many institutes. At the at Bagen University during my PhD, I had the chance to work with Drahan Meristem. They generated 12,000 mutants. And actually, so to our surprise, some of them were actually resistant and they are under uh, study in, in field conditions now in Philippines. So um, for us, of, as I mentioned before, we would like to have a Cavendish urgently, but the future for us is diversity. But you observe here with, with apples, we would like to see with bananas in the future. Just to, to finalize, I would like to, to point out these uh, few points. So the current pandemic of the Panama disease is caused by a single clone. It's not that the race one just changed and became tropical race four. The same is just moving thanks to humans. And it's difficult to compare da data with other researchers because every group uses a different protocol, either for uh, screening or genotyping. So it would be nice to standardize those protocols for every group so we can compare. Uh, a good thing is that resistance exists, as you could see. There are not many, but a few cultivars that we can use to breed bananas. Um, the efficacy of control measure is very poor. So Fusarium will for sure continue spreading. And something very important is to, men to mention is that there are the diversity of Fusarium related to banana is, is bigger. So there are more um, um, isolates that can, for example, be the tropical race five or something like that in the future. So they are restricted to Southeast Asia for now, but as the tropical race four at some point escape from that area to other areas, it's a con constant threat for the global banana production. So finally, I would like to thank my colleagues at Kijin, but also all my colleagues at Bakken University for all the, the support during the last years. With that, I have, uh, I finished my presentation, so if you have questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Garcia. Uh, I have two questions. I guess one is relating to something that hits closer to home. How, 
is there has there been any crossover to plantains for example that i know that it's also very big for caribbean and south american cultures yeah. Um, oh, oh, affected yeah. by the Panama the, the disease. And you mean if the plantains are also susceptible? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it's something that we don't really know for sure, but I, in my screenings that under greenhouse conditions, I include, of course, plantains because, of course, I'm from that area. And for me, plantains are even more important than bananas, mm -hmm. than sweet bananas. And of course, I included a, a few ones, and they are, I could say that at least not as susceptible as the Cavendish, but they are less susceptible, let's say. Mm -hmm. I see. And then another one would be, uh, you have talked about consolidating uh, and having a standardized phenotyping method. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you recommend uh, to people starting this? Well, it's very difficult because, of course, every group wants their own protocols to be used. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I really spend a lot of time of my PhD trying to standardize uh, the protocols. And as you as you could see, we, we, we did a big improvement in terms of quantity. And other thing is that being in the Netherlands is um, an advantage because in the Netherlands, the pathogen is not a quarantine organism. So we can really use it and as you and use it in in, in huge amounts uh, safely, while this cannot be done in countries which produce bananas because you know accidents can happen and just imagine if, if you produce thousands of uh, chlamydospores or something uh, in the lab and then you have an accident in a producing country. So it's, it's difficult. So yeah, of course I I, I publish my protocols. Uh, also, the book that we published last year is um, describe the methodology, which is actually very easy because the number of plants that I have to evaluate was bigger than just 50 plants. So we develop a lot of experience on that and, and the protocols are quite simple. So I will really recommend to use uh, the ones that are at least published. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have an additional question here by Renata Belazario. She asks, do you believe that quarantine measures should be even more strict in countries that have not reported a TR4? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But um, but it's so difficult. Um, when we started working in 2012, 2013, there were countries that had zero measurements in Latin America, absolutely zero. And then, um, of course, the problem was gaining more and more importance because it was spreading. So when it was detected in Jordan, it was like the first big alarm because for the first time, it was not a problem for Southeast Asia. So it was really a problem that was approaching us. And, and from then every year, at least a new two or three reports. And, and probably because before we didn't have tools to identify it easily, we didn't have the molecular diagnostics. So probably it was there already for many years, but it was probably in a, in a gross Michel or in another cultivar. And then people discover it when it went jump to a Cavendish. And that's the idea that we have in Colombia, for example. In Colombia, as I mentioned, is, is not that arrived last year. Probably it was there for already long time. And probably it's present in other countries that people have not identified because at the beginning, this disease is very slow. So the movement plant to plant happens very slow, but there is a point in which is just, you cannot control it. So mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, the measurements had been enforced last year and if you go to Ecuador for example and the first question they ask you is have you been in a country with tropical race 4 and if you say yes I was in Indonesia for example then they ask you to change your shoes they check your your suitcase it's, it's very strict and and it's the same in, in other countries like Costa Rica and Colombia because these countries are the main banana producers so the economy of these countries rely on bananas so just imagine if this happens Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> For the people who are left, are there any more questions? I kind of have a, a question. Um, so, so you're saying that hopefully you can get the diversity in, in supermarkets similar to, to apples. Mm -hmm. 
how, how do you think you would kind of get that started? Because sometimes Apple apples have the advantage of you can go to these these you pick locations and people can test it and try it and it can encourage like a following, if you will, of, of different types of apples. So is is there a certain method you would try to do, use to get different types of bananas out there? Yeah, that's a very difficult question because that's not part of my world, let's say. Uh, my world would be just to try to generate as much as possible, as much bananas as possible, quite diverse and hopefully resistant not only to tropical race four, but also to, to black cigatoka, for example, to nematodes, to other diseases. But of course, in this kind of thing, we cannot work alone. And unfortunately, the big industry is who rule the, the type of banana that we consume. So if we go, if you go to Latin America, you can just choose. This is very common. You go to the market and you can find at least 10 different types of bananas. And you actually, in my case, for example, I never even find the, try to find the Cavendish because there are better bananas than Cavendish. The problem is that those bananas are not suitable for the export market because they have very short shell life or they have a very th tiny skin, th not thick skin. So this is the kind of um, problems that we face with the diversity. So we cannot just bring bananas because there are bananas, there are there, many uh, types of bananas, but unfortunately everything is completely standardized for the Cavendish. So the, the size, the package, everything has to be Cavendish because that's how it works. Of course, if the industry, the like big companies wants to incorporate new bananas, they have to make all the promotion, all the marketing, offering new tastes, new shapes, new aromas. But of course, that's part of their work. And, and that also means that they have to change. They have to adapt everything. All the change had to, to be established for the new cultivar. What happened when we move from Gros Michel to Cavendish, for example, before the Gros Michel was just sent like that without any boxes. But then when the Cavendish came, they have to adapt to Cavendish with small uh, hands of the bananas in boxes with foam, with cold, and probably they have to adapt again for, for the new kind of bananas that will be produced in the future. Uh, there's Good another question. question in the chat too. Um, Shifeng wants to know uh, if there was a variety used to grow banana plants by seeds. Yes, um, essentially uh, it's, it's very weird to see bananas with seeds. I, I, I admit that. And actually, to be honest, before I started my work in bananas, I never seen a I never see uh, bananas with seeds. So it, it's very um, weird to see, but it's more common than you think. So of course we have the triploid bananas, seedless bananas that we are used to see in the supermarkets, but in nature that happens very often. So the, the wild types produce almost always seeds. Um, they are pollinated by birds, by, by bats, uh, insects. So Bananas with seeds are very common and there are hundreds of types of bananas. So essentially for breeders, that's what we need, right? Seeds, because we can combine them. So I'm just using usually, for example, a cultivar. Culti when I say cultivar, it's a banana that doesn't have seeds. And then I cross it with, um, yeah, I use the pollen of that one to, to cross with a wild type, for example. And the wild types usually always produce seeds. Dr. Charles, did you have a question? I saw your mic go off twice or something. I guess not. Well, I don't see Dr. Bennett here either. Um, well, uh, Dr. Garcia, thank you so much. And we're so sorry for uh, the interesting interruption. Uh, lesson learned. No Zoom on, on Twitter. 
<laughs> yes. No problem. Don't worry. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, have a great day. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much for the invitation and see you around. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.